Your career as a best-selling biographer took a huge leap forward next when you started working with Motley Crue, legendary creators of hair metal on the dirt, Confessions of the World's Most Notorious Rock Band. This actually began out of a story you were covering and writing with them on the road for Rolling Stone, right? During the Generation Swine Tour? It was done the Motley Crue way, which is fractious, disorganized, chaotic, and everyone dropped, threatened to drop out at any point. Like, I really think if we're talking about this, these skills uh, to life, and, and again, you know, being that, that being likable will really get you far. So, you know, I really, yeah, I really like Tommy and Nick and Vince and, and Mick. Like they're just such char such great characters and, and it was so interesting. So I really think that there were points when I remember Tommy got in that fist fight with Vince in the airport and he was like, I'm out of the book uh, or something. There was always some uh, drama to be, uh, to be, to be, to be, uh, to be taken care of. And my friend Ryan Holiday has a book called The, the Obstacle is the Way. And I think it's worth, just remembering that title that the, that all these things that we do, you know, are fraught with obstacles. And your John Karabi book obviously didn't make it through all the obstacles, over all the obstacles I've had yeah. some in either. And others, you really have to sort of fight for them and get involved. And it was crazy how many moments they were ready to sabotage it. And when it came out, they were all just over the moon and so happy. In the, in the realm of uh, co-writing, collaborating, ghostwriting, empathy really gets you far. Like I really love that I can step into these different personalities, and even more wild, wildly diverse personalities for, from my, my other books, if you really look at the, that, uh, that it's really trying to channel them, that my job, like e your ego and you stay out of it, right? You're just there to help them feel comfortable telling you all their stories and then writing, not as they speak, but writing how they would write if they were a writer. Fascinating. You know, cause it's not going to sound how they speak. No one wants to read that. But if they were a writer, how would they write that? So I also was faced with this challenge of how do I do a book? How do I do a book? I, I hadn't, couldn't find a book that was done by a group before. I'm sure they exist, but I couldn't find one. So, and I love these, I love these creative problems and these creative challenges. Uh, and so I remember going to um, Book Soup here and looking for books that have multiple points of view. Rashomon, uh, Wilkie Collins, The Woman in White, I'd already read as, as I Lay Dying, but looking for books with multiple points of view is sort of a model. And I modeled some of it on As I Lay Dying uh, that Nikki, as you said, is the headstrong one, you know? So he's Jewel. You know, Tommy's a little bit of Daryl, like the sweet sort of innocent, you know, one. So I took on the, you know, I kind of modeled them, on, modeled that and every now and then As I Lay Dying is this family going on this sort of a almost pointless quest to bury their mom. And every now and then a neighbor looks in from the outside and sees the, ridiculousness of the whole situation. So I'd use Doc McGee or someone else on the outside in Motley Crue's periphery, Tom Zutow, to, uh, to provide some perspective. And it became a real, it became really fun. I didn't, the only other model I could find was more of the Please Kill Me, Legs McNeil and Jillian Carr, I think her name, Jillian, I forget her last name, Carr, I think. Yeah. Probably on that. Uh, that book where, uh, where it's told, where it's just a bunch of kind of quotes. It's just like a long interview, but I feel, that book's amazing by the way. Uh, but I do feel like that format can get uh, tiresome to read. So, uh, so I went with that and we had, we had these ground rules too. I've talked about them before, but, but the ground rules were, you know, it's fun. You really want to set up an intention when you start. Uh, and, uh, and one of the grounds rules was you can't read someone else's chapter till it's done and you can't change what's in their chapter. If you don't, if Tommy doesn't like what Vince says about him or vice versa, you can respond in your chapter. You can't change that. And it's so, you know, it provides that Rashomon experience of, three different, four different perspectives of the same scene and a little bit of interplay if like, you know, sometimes they found out someone slept with their girlfriend or wife by reading the pages of the book. Yeah. Talk about a tricky proposition. Tommy had already left the group by this point while you were still writing the book. How did you manage to keep speaking to him without it conflicting with the other band members? Yeah, I'd go to, I'd go to his house. So yeah, I remember he had this flaming Dr. Pepper machine set up and yeah, that was when he was like friends with the, working with the Crystal Method and the, uh, yeah, so I'd go to his house. I'd meet them each in their world. Okay. Tommy usually in his home, uh, Vince at the the cigar club called the Havana Room. Mick at you know his he never leaves the home in in Agora Hills. And again, I would try to. It's just fun if you really take on stuff is like, uh, is not a job but a challenge. Uh, it's exciting. So remember with Tommy, I'd take pieces words he'd use in his emails to me, and and put those words in like. He's like, I'm just home marinating. So I use the word marinating. I would never use that word. I never even think about using that word, but I would use that. Or Mick, we'd go through his computer 
you know, these all these kind of philosophical essays on or thoughts of like, what if Earth is the penal colony for other planets and we're just kind of the Australia of the world or whatever. And so I'd use his writings in there because you really want to channel the artist as much as possible. It's such a fun thing to do. This band's had so many infamous moments from Nikki Six's fatal heroin overdose, where he then was revived by a paramedic but had died for a minute legally, to Vince Neil's losing his daughter to cancer, and so many other things in between. What were a few of the most challenging and maybe moving moments that you had with these guys as they were really opening up to you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think Nikki's overdose story, like I think they're stories that are easier for artists to tell because let's say there's kind of cool, like I overdosed and survived is a little bit of a badge of pride. But when Vince is talking about losing his daughter Skylar uh, to cancer, like it's the worst, it's the worst pain a human being. What I think, I don't know, as a father, I would say it's for the worst pain I could ever think of experiencing ever. So to, so I just I remember him talking about it and me crying. I remember writing about it and me crying. And I think that writing requires the 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 willingness to be vulnerable and open up about the 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 things that are painful or uncomfortable or scary and that's really where 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 the heart of these things are and and i really think that i just if i think of one moment that stands out it was i'll just remember sitting at the vanna room and you know vince having a few beers and him talking about that and uh and then being entrusted with that story to tell it in a way that that honors her honors her and his experience of it i'd really think of that more than the uh you know insanity Looking back 20 years later, when you got the book in hand and you saw the Jack Daniels bottle on the cover and the whole beautiful design of it, did you know maybe that there was something special about this book and that it might actually have a chance of getting up the New York Times? I'm sure you didn't expect it to go all the way to number one, become such a phenomenon. I had no idea. That was it. Yeah, I had no, I had no idea. And that was the point. I, I remember the, the point I was going to make is you don't know. I was simultaneously working on a book with Dave Navarro. I thought the Dave Navarro book was going to be the bigger one. <laughs> You know, uh, and again, he kind of got scared uh, uh, and held it up for a couple of years, um, which happens when you're working with other people. Um, so I really thought that Dave was going to be the bigger one, the Motley Crue one. I was sort of like, was, you know, who knows? Uh, but, and, and that really is like, you don't know. As an artist, as a writer, as a creator, you have no idea whether it will succeed or not and why it will succeed. You don't know. And, and that's why you just have to do it with your head down and, and do the work and the rest is out of your control. Uh, things I thought would be big weren't big. Things that I didn't think were big would be big. And, and I'm sure a lot of people laugh. You can try to backward engineer it afterward. But the truth is like you sort of, there's a surrender involved of being an artist. And you just, if there's a theme, it's like you just do the work to the best that you can. And then you release it to the world. You move on to the next. And it's up to the, it's up to uh, forces beyond your control to decide what it is and whether it's good. And by the time they've decided, you're already on to the next project. What kind of advice do you have for the aspiring author that might be watching who has an aspiration beyond journalism to actually go out and write books with bands like this? I'm sure everybody who does this show uh, says, it's just, here's what worked for me and I rec people will recommend what worked for them and realize you're gonna cut your own path. So I'm not saying this is general advice, but it really worked for me to ghost write books before writing my first book. And what's great about it is not that you don't have to do the press and the media, you know, there's kind of less at stake and you really get to understand how the publishing process works. And I'm sure if I hadn't ghost written books before doing my own, I wouldn't have had the experience necessary to make it, uh, for it to do well. Just write it for you. The thing is just like, there, there are so many stories people get stuck in their heads about that are distractions. So just write it for you. Don't worry about the audience. Don't worry about the agent. Don't worry about the marketing. Don't worry about the title. Just vomit what you have to say out there. If you can't write, record it and then have someone transcribe it and someone rewrite it. Like you don't even have to, I'm sure there are plenty of writers that probably don't even write their own books, right? So, so just vomit it, vomit this mess out there so that somewhere on, on the, in the, in these, like this stack of pages or this giant computer file or this, you know, series of audio recordings, <clears throat> what you want to say is there and just needs to be carved. So, <clears throat> you know, I always, and just, we get so precious about stuff and we think that this is going to be our only book and it has to say everything and accomplish these things. And then we create our own writer's block. I, to me, writer's block is performance pressure. And if you subtract the performance approval, popularity sales element from it, 
you can actually just write. Because again, you can sit down with anyone and say, hey, I'm going to give you a sentence, write off this sentence for 15 minutes, go. And pretty much anybody could do it. Then if you say, and there's going to be a literary critic here that's going to decide whether the fate of your future, depending on what you write, they'll start to choke. So just remove the audience from your mind. The first draft is only for you and just really get it out there. And we spend more time worrying about what we're going to write. Most people spend more time worrying about what they're going to write than actual, actual writing.